Good morning, One Hope. My name is Kate Houghton. I'm married to Paul. And as you can see, I've kicked him out of his natural habitat um, so that I can have a turn today. I did take the liberty of turning the books around um, because I don't know about you, but I find books on people's shelves in Zoom calls and online to it to be a massive distraction. And I try to look and see what they've got. Have they really read them? I guess we'll never know. I want to know, have you ever watched the person in front of you at the checkout and seen the way that they um, relate to the cashier? Or have you seen a friend relating to their family members? Or maybe seen another side of a person and you've overheard them on a call to a service provider? Telecom, for example. The way that we relate to other people says a lot about who we are at our deepest levels. And I think it's really helpful to look at the way that Jesus related to people. Over the past few weeks, we've been looking at his interactions with um, with people while he was on earth. We saw his exchange with the Samaritan woman at the well. And we looked last week at his conversation with Peter. This week, I want to look at the story of Mary and Martha. Obviously, it's a very well-known passage of scripture. Um, many of us will be familiar with it. But let's just go back and see if we can kind of revisit some of the lessons that we might have learned from this piece of scripture over the years. I'm going to go ahead and read it. I'm going to the end of Luke chapter 10 to verse 38. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen a good portion, which will not be taken away from her. That's the ESV, um, English Standard Version. Well, some of you might be wondering why there are so many translations, why are there so many versions? And basically the answer is um, that translators take a slightly different approach with each version. And um, so the ESV, for example, is a literal translation. Every word is translated literally from the original language to English. And um, whereas the NLT, um, the New Living Translation, is it takes concepts. The translators take concepts and then try and translate those, those whole concepts into English. So it's just a slightly different approach. Um, another way to read the Bible is to use a paraphrase, um, like the message. This is, it should be, it should be definitely used alongside um, a translation uh, so that we don't miss anything in the original text. Eugene Peterson wrote the message, he paraphrased scripture, um, as a way of making it more accessible rather than replacing it. All that to say, I'm going to read it now in the message. As they continued their travel, Jesus entered a village. A woman by the name Martha welcomed him and made him feel quite at home. She had a sister Mary who sat before the master hanging on every word he said, but Martha was pulled away by all she had to do in the kitchen. Later, she stepped in interrupting him. Master, don't you care that my sister has abandoned the kitchen to me? Tell her to lend me a hand. The master said, Martha, dear Martha, you're fussing far too much and getting yourself worked up over nothing. One thing only is essential, and Mary has chosen it. It is the main course and won't be taken from her. So you can see that there's just a little bit extra in the message. I use the message often as a kind of like a, the first port of call when it comes to commentary. I want to make three points from this text um, this morning. Namely, there is value in both serving and sitting. The second point will be God is in the mess. And my last point is let's not hide the mess. First up then, there is value in both serving and sitting. When we look at this placement of, or the placement of the story in Luke's gospel, we see that it seems to be out of chronological order. Jesus and his disciples were traveling to Jerusalem, and we know from elsewhere in scripture that Martha and Mary's house was in Bethany, which was close to Jerusalem. However, later in Luke's account in chapter 17, we see that Jesus was still far from Jerusalem. So this naturally raises the question of why Luke chose to give this account here. Now, immediately before Mary and Martha's story is told, 
um, Luke has recounted the parable that Jesus told of the Good Samaritan, which is a story about the value of serving others, regardless of creed, colour or any difference to us. Uh, so serving therefore can't be a bad thing, as definitely commended throughout scripture. So it's suggested by many commentators that the placement of the Mary and Martha story is to safeguard against the notion that salvation or being saved and accepted by God comes through works, when in fact works should come out of an overflow of the joy that we have in our salvation. We see um, in the language that's used that there's a, a big economy of words here. There's a, there's a, a lot packed into quite a short amount of, of space. And with such economy of words in recounting the story, we can be sure that no word is used carelessly. In the ESV, we see, we see the word welcome. Okay? So it says, Martha welcomed him into her house. And we see this further, further expanded in the message, which remember we're using as a kind of commentary. And so the, the message says, Martha welcomed him into her house and made him feel quite at home. Now, welcome is definitely a good thing. Hospitality is commended throughout scripture. It's a good thing to feel welcome. Indeed, when it's boiled down to its roots of essentially expressing affirmation and acceptance, it's maybe even a basic need. And Jesus couldn't have felt at home or welcome in Mary and Martha's house without some aspect of Martha's serving or, you know, both of their serving. Think of any place that you've been and you felt welcome and you'll probably find that there's serving behind that. So you stay over at a friend's house and they've made the bed and maybe, you know, a little chocolate on the pillow. Or maybe you've gone to visit somebody and they've prepared a meal for you. So the problem isn't therefore the serving. The problem is when we forget why we're serving and the serving kind of becomes the main feature. It takes the place of the one who calls us to serve and we find ourselves in a kind of proverbial cart before the horse situation. <laughs> so in this passage, we see that Martha has got so caught up in preparing for and presumably trying to kind of continue to make Jesus feel welcome that she's distracted from Jesus himself, his company and his teaching. Her proverbial cart, her serving has passed her horse, Jesus, without her seeming to have even noticed or to, without her noticing it's, it's a problem. And she comes to Jesus essentially demanding that he reprimand Mary for being lazy. She says, Lord, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? And then in the message, Peterson suggests like a further, tell it in the hand. Now, she might not have sounded quite that petulant, but I think some of us can, maybe all of us, can recognize this kind of odor of petulance um, from personal experience. Surely we've all felt that there have been situations where we've been maybe doing the lion's share of the work or that we have um, not been recognized for work that we've been doing. And sometimes this will be true. We are flawed and we live with flawed people. Maybe for us, it's the sting of the WhatsApp that comes through um, calling us to put our hands up for setup on a Sunday morning. You know, back in the day when we actually met together and got dressed for church. Um, and we maybe feel in that moment the rising indignation of why doesn't anyone know how busy we are? How can they call us to, to, how can they ask us to do any more? And that might be true. But in that moment, we're missing the point of setup, I think. The point of setup is to create a place where we can gather. The writer of Hebrews chapter 10 encourages us to meet together so that we can um, stir each other up to love and good works. Um, that we can encourage each other and, and edify each other. That's the, that's the purpose of setup. The purpose of setup isn't just to appease some bonkers notion that we need to drag all sorts of stuff out into the hall. That's not the point. The point is we want to meet with Jesus. Or perhaps in a slightly different outworking of this breed of petulance, it might be, um, and really I am so in there, and perhaps I'm actually just talking to myself, in which case just bear with me. In a, so in a slightly different outworking, maybe it's the frustration of somebody doing our thing badly. Maybe, maybe you always make the tea in life group, right? And you've got a reputation for being really the, the best tea maker. You know how to make a perfect brew. Um, but then you come one day and you see that the new person is making the tea and out of the corner of your eye, you see them squeeze the bag. Now, tannins are being released all over the place. That tea is going to be bitter you realize that substandard tea is about to be served to the rest of your life group and some of them might even think it's you. 
Now, I understand that temptation to alert somebody to the terrible mishap, but I do think we'd be missing the point there. You see, because meeting, the purpose of meeting together is to meet together, to be with Jesus, to encourage each other, um, to sit at Jesus' feet. The point is not great tea, but great tea is important. It helps. And the situation might need to be addressed, you know? You might, you might need to give some people some, some lessons on how you like your tea. But it's never going to be the main attraction. We might dress up our reactions into something sort of more acceptable. So if I'd been Martha in this situation, maybe I would have chosen passive aggression as my modus operandi and gone into the kitchen, scrubbed the dishes a little too hard and played something like this over in my head. Oh, Mary, you poor thing. It's been a hard day. You just go sit down there at Jesus' feet. I've got the dishes. Or I might have used the ultimate beastmaster when it comes to Christian living. The please pray for me. Jesus, will you pray, pray for my heart? I just need grace to be able to carry on serving while Mary sits at your feet and just really enjoys your presence. Now this one might have aspects of righteousness, even if the request for prayer is a bit muddled in its motives. But I still think in that moment I would have missed the point. You see, the point of this story is not that Mary is good and Martha is bad or vice versa. It's actually just that Mary has found Jesus and Martha has kind of missed the point or has forgotten it and she's therefore losing out and that's not what Jesus wants. Now Jesus in his reply to Martha is incredibly gentle and kind. He says Martha, Martha and remember the economy of words that we spoke of okay so he's saying her name twice and he is he's doing that to express compassion. We see this elsewhere in scripture and then we see also in the message that Peterson expands that for us too. And then he goes on to validate her. And that's my absolute favorite part of the passage, just um, for your information. He says, you're anxious and troubled about many things. See, he says to her, I see you. I see what you're experiencing. I acknowledge that you are sort of in a tiz. Now, I think for me, this has been one of the most important lessons I've learned in raising children. And it's gone on and is, is hopefully continuing to go on into my other relationships. If I can validate my children and other people when they come to me in a bit of a tiz, I find that I can kind of defuse them. And then, and then that puts them in a better position to be able to hear what I have to say. So validating them is not agreeing. He's not agreeing that Martha is right to feel anxious and troubled. I see this process of validation almost like stopping a football before you kick it on. Now I don't know a lot about football but I do know that you're supposed to stop the ball before you kind of wallop it on to wherever you're wanting it to go. So that gives you time to both kind of stop the momentum and redirect it physically um, and also to mentally prepare and decide where you want it to go. So if I, if, if Annabeth, my two-year-old, is maybe having a tantrum because she doesn't want to get off the swing, but she has to get off the swing because we have to go and fetch her brothers and sisters at school, you know, I can either just pick her up and, and put her in the car, which eventually will work, um, whilst I tell her, you know, stop being so selfish, or I can actually just say to her in that moment, Annabeth, you, you're feeling really frustrated, aren't you? You love the swings. When she feels seen, she is... She, it's almost like pressing that magic diffuse button and I can actually just say to her, the problem is, Annabeth, that we need to go. And it's the same here. Jesus does that with Martha. He says, you're anxious and troubled about many things. He stops the football before he kicks it into the most glorious place where he tells her that actually there's something better than the serving. Mary has found and chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her indicating and implicating Martha in that as well. He's saying, Martha, it's yours too. See, the portion that he's referring to is not literally food. Um, it's far more than that. It's, he likened himself to water with the woman at the well. He said that he, if she drank of, of his water, then she would never thirst again. And it's the same here. He's saying he himself is the purpose of life. He will fill your spiritual need. You see, it's not our serving that matters, but it helps pave the way. If Martha and Mary had not created a welcome environment, Jesus might not have visited them. 
in order for them to even sit at his feet. It's our relationship with Jesus that's important and which cannot be taken away from us. Okay, our second point then is God is in the mess. So given the fact that we've established that Mary is onto something and Martha's focus is misguided, how then do we deal with the dishes of life? They need to get done after all. Um, I mean, setup needs to be done on a Sunday so that we can meet together. My kids have to clean their room so they can sleep in there. And tea needs to be good. Now, since Jesus is generally not in our lounges with his feet displayed for us to sit at, how do we know when we're at his feet? Now, I've got a friend who offers me very wise counsel. Um, and I was sitting with her one day and explaining to her that I feel really frustrated with the, the distractions in my life. I've got five children under 13 and I, I love being with them. I love helping them with homework. I love sitting on the floor and doing puzzles with them. But it seems like the mess of life just kind of encroaches on that all the time. And I was explaining to this friend, I just feel so guilty and so bad that, that my daughter is, is sitting on the floor waiting for me basically to be finished with whatever I'm doing so that I can come sit with her. And it feels like I can't stop doing what I'm doing, otherwise life is kind of just gonna come pouring down over our ears. Anyway, she said to me, um, where do you think God is in that moment? Do you think he is with you in the kind of tidying and the bringing of order, or do you think he's on the floor with your daughter in the mess? And I kind of thought about the question and I thought, well, it's rhetorical, right? So I should definitely know the answer. And so there's a human on the floor. Um, so he must be there because there's not a human on the shelves that I'm tidying. Although some of you've met Joshua, my five-year-old. He's sometimes on the shelves. Maybe God's on the shelves. But the more I thought, well, he can't be in the serving because he's on the floor with the kid, the more empty and annoying the, the clearing and serving became. And then... I realized he's in it all. He's there in the mess, he's there in the clean, and most importantly, he is in the chaos of the coexistence of both of them. You see, Jesus is not waiting for my house to be clean or my life to be in order before he turns up. He's there all the time. I get to be with him in all of it. He is my portion in all of it. He is in the frustration of the squeezed tea bag. He's there at six o'clock in the morning on a Sunday. And he's there with my poor children at five o'clock every evening when they have to clean up their mess. But he's there waiting for us to receive our portion from him. See, Martha was preparing a home for the guest, but she was missing the guest. Maybe she didn't want the mess of knowing what needed to that like the, the dishes needed to be done while she sat at Jesus' feet. And I can identify with that. You see, it, but it's not what we do that necessarily needs to change, though it doubtless will in some way or another. It's our, it's our motivation that needs to change. You see, if we've got Jesus front and center, if we're focused on the main course rather than the preparation for it, we'll find that the preparation happens anyway. It's just our focus that changes. I remember when I was about 15 years old and I would drive with my dad as a passenger and um, he would teach me kind of the theory of driving, you know, spot the hazard and stuff like that. I remember that one day I was sitting there and he said to me, where are you looking? And I said, well, I'm looking at the road. And he said, yes, but which part of the road? And I said, I'm looking at the road right in front of the bonnet. That's where I always looked as a passenger. And he said, no, you can't look there. Do you want to know where I'm looking? I'm looking at that car way over there in the distance. I said, yeah, but you, if you look there, then you're not going to see what you're doing now. And he said, no, if you look at just the road in front of you, you're going to crash because you're going to come up against an obstacle sooner than, you know, before you've seen it. He said, if you, you, you try it. You focus on that car over there and you'll see actually all of the foreground you can see. It's just not maybe in the same focus as it was. You've just got to focus on where you're going and everything else will get done. And I've thought about that often. I think it's just such a great picture of life. When we focus on what needs to be done, we kind of lose sight of where we're going. But if we focus on our goal, then what needs to get done 
kind of just gets done. Uh, or, you know, obviously it's not like it just magically happens. But the angst and the anguish somehow gets taken out of, of the serving and the, the work that it takes to get to the goal. See, if Martha could have focused maybe on, on Jesus rather than what was in her own foreground that evening, maybe she would have saved herself a lot of anxiety. Our third point then is let's not hide our mess. One of the joys of life is when people come to my house spontaneously. It's scary and it's fun um, and it's really vulnerable because I live in both proverbial and literal mess often. Um, but there's actually such a joy and relief about having people see real life. And better than that is when popper inners become stayers for dinner um, because then they really see the chaos. I can totally identify with Martha feeling like she needs and wants to make her guest feel welcome. But at a certain point, the welcoming, or in my case, what actually turns into flustering, can run away with me and I can forget my guest. I've had friends, plural, watch me burn dinner. And I don't mean that they've kind of stood there while dinner's burnt and I've been distracted in another room. No, I have like actively burnt the dinner in front of them while I've been kind of talking to them and like trying to make them feel welcome. Um, I've had at least one friend um, witness my children spontaneously burst into prayer for me because I've been incredibly grumpy. Um, and I've also had great conversations with people who've just been maybe at my house and we haven't finished chatting. So they jump in the car and come on school run with me. Um, now, it's not that I, in those moments, kind of share every naked thought with people, but it is the uncuffed version of my life. Um, and I know I've gained far more from seeing other people's real life than I have maybe from seeing their kind of their come to dinner life. You know, the, 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 the moments where, you know, the agenda is set, the table is set, the house is clean, it's, everything's prepared. Um, and those moments are good. The food, generally speaking, is much better in those moments as well. So I'm not, I'm not suggesting that we don't do those moments, but, but I think that we can learn a lot about how to deal with the mess of life by being invited into other people's mess. And so we need, we owe it to each other to kind of, to show that off a little bit more. Come see my burnt rice. Now, I know that when I'm marthering, um, there's often a part of me that's trying to justify my existence, trying to sell myself as being competent. And we see from Martha's exchange with Jesus that she's looking for recognition too. She's selling herself. She says, my sister has left me to serve alone. Like, look at me. I'm, I'm steadfast in the face of distraction. But Jesus doesn't want what she's selling. He doesn't want a clean kitchen. He just wants her. That's what the Christian faith is in a nutshell. God wants us, not our deeds. Our deeds and behavior will, of course, change in response to him, but that's the order. It's not the other way around. Now, if you're waiting to say yes to Jesus and his offer of life in abundance, if you don't know him yet, and you're waiting maybe until your ducks are in a row or until your life is tidy enough or until you feel presentable enough or until you feel you can blend in with a bunch of Christians, can I just save you some time and tell you that you can just say yes now? You see, the portion is yours. The mess is just a kind of part of life, this side of heaven. It's the same for all of us. And I'm really sorry if, if, if as Christians, we've tried to kind of sell you sort of a half truth um, and try to present you with something that's a little bit cleaner than what our real life is. Our, everybody's life is, is messy. God made something perfect in Eden. It, it was tidy and it was ordered and he'll do that again. But in the meantime, daily we choose against God. Adam and Eve chose against God. We daily choose against him and we make a mess of the paradise he created. But Jesus came to make a way through the mess for us. And he promises never to leave us or forsake us as we journey through it with him. As, as Christians, I really want to urge us to invite people in. And I don't just mean other Christians. I mean everyone. In, in his book, Scattered Servants, Alan Scott actually just puts it beautifully. And being that I don't have Eugene Peterson's gift of the paraphrase, um, I am going to read it for us. 
While some of us fear losing our faith, I suspect others struggle to involve unbelievers in their lives for a very different reason. We're not afraid of becoming like them. We're afraid of letting them see the real us. We are painfully aware of our weaknesses, our imperfections and our failures. We wonder, how can I talk about the night and day difference Christ makes in a life when at times my own life is a mess? So here's what we tend to do. We work on sorting our life out before we share it. And of course, our lives are never really sorted. And that's okay. It's more than okay. It's divine design. We have this treasure in jars of clay. Our communities are drawn to brokenness more than excellence. We try to impress them with our brilliance, but our brokenness and imperfection are our greatest gifts. Focus on sharing your life before you sort it. You don't need to have it all together before you give it all away. Indeed, you won't find the life you're looking for until you start to share the life you have. You can't sell something that's broken, but as believers we have nothing to sell and everything to share. And you can't share something until it's broken. People around us need our brokenness as much as our wholeness. People in your industry, family and community have become so scarred by life that they are desperate to know if it's possible to recover. If you have a neat, sanitized life, they are never going to ask you to explain where your hope comes from. They'll never ask you how to deal with stress, unforgiveness and debt. However, if you vulnerably open up your pain and and with integrity open up your past, they will see there is hope. They will start asking, how did you recover? How are you recovering? What is the source of your hope? So wherever you are in this journey this week, I encourage you to get at the feet of Jesus. Actively ignore the distractions in your life and try to find him. Try to give him space to talk to you. Practically, that might mean, you know, setting aside some time to read, pray, worship, or maybe go over some prophecies that, that were spoken over you or into your life over the years. Maybe it will be um, revisiting some of the desires and dreams that you have had over the years. But make space for him. Make space to refocus on him. And let people in. Let people see your journey. Because we don't have a belief system to sell. It's not our responsibility to sell this to anyone, not even ourselves. Our responsibility is to share the good news that Jesus came to our mess and he is and will forever be our portion and that will never be taken away from us. May the Lord bless you this week in your journey towards him.